When it comes to pinpointing which dinosaur in the Jurassic Park franchise is the most dangerous of them all, none can hold a candle to the savage and intelligent Velociraptor. And while in Michael Crichton's first novel, we didn't get to see much aggression within the species itself, it, w it was only until Steven Spielberg's film adaptation of the novel, where we were introduced to a certain Velociraptor, nicknamed The Big One, who was known to have killed many of its own kind and left only two alive to dominate and use as subordinates. And this take of the Velociraptor was so inspirational that Michael Crichton himself actually changed the Velociraptor for his sequel novel, The Lost World, where they would be shown to be more aggressive than they could ever be on screen. And while the film adaptation only gives us a brief look to the savage lives of these creatures, the novel showed a dark side to them that has never been able to be on the screen. With the Velociraptors that would eventually lead to a problem of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom's Indoraptor. And for anyone who hasn't seen the second novel, we're going to see why these raptors behave the way they do. And for that, we have to go all the way to the Velociraptor's nest on Isla Sorna. Thorn brought the car to a stop and there was silence. They peered out the windows, trying to see where they were, but it was so dark it was hard to see anything. They seemed to be at the bottom of a deep gully, a, of a canopy of trees overhead. We must be in a steam bed, Levine said, and Thorn th thought he was right as his eyes adjusted. The raptors were running down the center of the steam bed, which was lined with big boulders on both sides, but the bed itself was sandy, and it was wide enough for the car to pass through. He followed them. Do you have any idea where we are? Levine asked. No, Thorn said. The car drove forward, very quietly not to, to attract the attention of the raptors. The stream bed widened, opening to a flat basin. The boulders then disappeared. There were trees on both sides of the river, patches of moonlight appeared here and there, and it was easier to see. But the raptors were now gone. He stopped the car and rolled down the window and listened for them. He could hear the hissing of the raptors and their growls as well. The sound seemed to be coming off from the left of the stream. Thorn pulled the car into gear and left the stream bed, moving among the ferns and occasional pine trees. Levine said, Do you suppose the boy survived the hill? I don't know, Thorn said. I can't imagine. He drove forward sl slowly and then came in a break of trees. And he saw a clearing where ferns had been trampled flat. Beyond the clearing, he could see the banks of the river, moonlight glinting on the water. Somehow, they had returned to the river, but it was the clearing itself that had held their attention. Within the broad open space, they saw a huge pile of pale skeletons of several apatosaurs, the giant rib cages, arcs of pale bone, shining in the silver light of the moon. The dark hulk, hulk of a particularly eaten carcass lay on the side of the center, clouds of flies buzzing across it. What is this place? It looks like a graveyard, Thorn said, but it's not. The raptors were spotted, all clustered to one side, fighting over what remained of Eddie's carcass. At the opposite side of the clearing, they saw three l low mud mounds. The walls were broken in many places, within the nest saw crushed fragments of what were eggshells, and there was a strong stench of decay. Levine sat forward in shock, stating, this is the raptor nest. Back at the trailer in the darkness, Malcolm sat up, wincing, and he grabbed the, a radio. You found the nest of the raptors? Levine spoke and said yes. Malcolm asked for them to describe it. Levine quietly stated that the velociraptor nest appeared Sloven, uncared for, ill-made. And he was surprised by this, because dinosaur nests usually conveyed an unmistakable sense of order. Levine had seen it time and time again in fossil sites from Montana to Mongolia. However, these raptors behaved far differently. They were disorderly, chaotic feeling, and, and to him, it seemed like they were more interested in killing each other than taking care of their nest. A broken mound were stepped on, and he saw scattered bones of small dinosaurs, which he presumed to be the remains of certain newborns. He saw no living infants in the clearing, 
there were three juveniles, but these younger animals were forced to fend for themselves and already showed many scars on their bodies. The, the youngsters looked at him, undernourished, poking on the, the carcasses. They were cautious, backing away whenever one of the adults would snap about them. What about the apatosaurus, Malcolm said. What about the carcasses? Levine counted that there were at least four altogether in various stages of decomposition. Levine was wondering something else about them, though. He was wondering what they were doing there. Surely they hadn't died here by accident. They must have been dragged by the river. But that didn't make sense on how that was possible. They brought Arby, Malcolm said. Yes, as they spotted... They were looking for the cage that Arby had managed to slip into during the attack on the high hide. Levine stared at the nest, trying to figure it out, and then Thor nudged him. There's the cage, he said, pointing. At the far side of the clearing, lying on the ground, a particular hidden behind fronds. Levine couldn't see Arby, though, and he was fearing the worst. The raptors were still ignoring the cage, as they were fighting each other over what remained of Eddie's corpse. Thorn brought out a Lindstrat rifle and snapped it open, and he saw only six darts, but that wasn't enough, and he had to put them back. There were at least ten raptors in the clearing. Levine grabbed something from the back seat. He found his knapsack and unzipped it and came out with a large can that looked like a, like a soft drink bottle. It had a skull of crossbones stenciled into it, and it was labeled Caution. Toxic? What's that? something they cooked up in Los Alamos. Levine stated that it was a non-lethal area neutralizer, releases a short-acting cholesterol aerosol, paralyzes all life forms for up to three minutes, it'll knock the raptors out. Thorne got concerned by this and stopped him, but what about the boy? You can't use that, you'll paralyze him too. Levine tried to point out an idea he had, if throwing it to the right of the cage and the cat gas will blow away from him and towards the raptors. But Thorne said it was too risky, as if the wind changed direction, it would instantly hit him and not the raptors, leaving them exposed, and reminding him that he may be too injured that he can't handle it. Levine then nodded and put it back. So what's your plan? What do we do now? Thorne looked at the aluminum cage, partially blocked by the ferns, and he saw something that made him sit up. The cage moved slightly, and he realized that Arby was still alive. I'm going to get the kid out of there. But how, Levine said, the old fashioned way. And he climbed, and Thorne climbed out of the car. Meanwhile, the raptors were s still oblivious to the presence of Thorne and Levine. And they continued to tear at what remained of the upper carcass off to the one side. But the intensity and behavior was d diminishing. Some of the animals had begun turning away and rubbing their jaws with their clawed hands, drifting slowly towards the center, moving closer to the cage. Thorne climbed back into the jeep, pushing aside the canvas cover, and he checked the rifle in his hands. Levine slid into driver's seat, and he started the engine. Thorne steadied himself to get him ready to grab the ca cage. He told Levine to punch it, and the jeep raced forward, and the raptors looked up in surprise as they saw the intruder finally. But the Jeep had gotten to the cage first, getting in between them and using the skeletons as a l little bit of protection to slow them down. However, as soon as Thorn went to grab the cage, there was one raptor that was waiting for him, and he realized then that this was not going to be an easy task to finish. This particular scene would not be used in the film adaptation, however, the social behavior would in fact be an important feature for future installments, and while in the Lost World film, we only get a brief look at the social struggle of the raptors, with two of them fighting each other over for the right to kill Sarah Harding. But in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, we would be shown that the Indoraptor was having this the same problem as Dr. Wu states that they needed Blue's DNA in order to have the empathetic traits in her DNA for the next Indoraptor, as the current one was far more difficult to reason with. But anyway, guys, what do you think about this scene? Do you think there's that it has a chance to appear in Dominion? Personally, I think that it could have a place with either of the new raptor species. But whatever your thoughts and opinions happen to be, I'd love to hear them all in the comments down below. 
But if you've enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a like, and if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to join the hunt. Be safe, and until the next my Clang novel, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.